Welcome to The Flowered Path. On today's episode, I'll be presenting the biography of Saint Hilarion. Before we get to our saint, I want to mention the Flowered Path t-shirts again. You can find those on Etsy. The shop name is Lost Grave, one word. I'll also put a link in the show notes. Right now I have sizes small through extra large, but not too many. So if you want one, you might want to grab one sooner rather than later. 2XL and 3XL shirts are already sold out. I don't know when I'll be making more of these, so you probably want to grab one now. I am still including vinyl stickers of the Flowered Path logo with every t-shirt order. One more note before we get started. I just want to put this out there to anyone listening. If you feel you've had a miracle or an intercession or prayers answered on behalf of a saint and you'd like to share your story, i definitely like to start collecting those stories as well for The Flowered Path. My email address is thefloweredpath at gmail.com. Just go ahead and send me a note with a little bit about your story. Now let's check the news. On March 31st, 2023, the French Bishops' Conference announced an opening of the calls for beatification of Henri de Lubac, an influential 20th century Jesuit theologian who argued for a revived interest in the teachings of the early Church Fathers. De Lubac was born in France in 1896 and briefly studied law before entering the Jesuit novitiate of the Society of Jesus at age 17. With the outbreak of World War I, he joined the military in 1914. On All Saints Day in 1917, he was seriously wounded in a fierce battle in northeastern France. The head injury he sustained at this time would cause him to suffer from headaches and dizziness for the rest of his life. Eventually, he returned to his theological studies and was ordained as a priest in 1927. During World War II, de Lubac was involved in the French resistance to occupation by the Nazis, including the publication of an underground newsletter called Christian Testimony, which argued that the philosophies and activities of the Nazi regime were incompatible with the teachings of Christ. When many of his fellow collaborators in the underground publication and resistance effort were captured and executed, de Lubac went into hiding, taking with him some notebooks of writings that he continued to develop, with the defeat of the Nazis and the end of the occupation in France, de Lubac came out of hiding and published the text that he'd been working on during the war years. Although post-war paper shortages contributed to publication delays. One of these new texts was delved into the spiritual nature of humanity and its relationship to grace became a controversial flashpoint amongst other Catholic scholars. The resulting outrage was so pervasive that de Lubac was asked to leave his teaching position in 1950, and his publications were withdrawn from circulation for a time. While ostracized from the church, de Lubac continued to study and write, demonstrating an expansive interest in human spiritual experience. He went on to publish three books on Buddhism during this time. In 1960, de Lubac's social and ecclesiastical exile came to an end when he was personally appointed as a consultant to the Second Vatican Council by Pope Paul VI. He went on to co-found a theological journal and become a cardinal. De Lubac died on September 4, 1991, at the age of 95. An ancient tradition persists among Christians in Jerusalem's old city, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre plays host to the Holy Fire Ceremony, an ancient tradition in which a candle is set aflame in some mysterious way in the tomb of Jesus Christ. A Greek Orthodox priest reaches into the dim tomb and withdraws an ignited candle. This flame is used to ignite another and another until the entire church is illuminated by the flames. As bells ring out, the congregation shouts, Christ is risen. The church, which rests upon the site which tradition holds Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected, is a place of pilgrimage for a great number of Christian followers. The numbers of worshippers allowed to enter 
are somewhat restricted by Israel police, who try to control the crowd, citing safety concerns. Following calls from the church to ignore police barriers, many Christians passed through. The ceremony remained peaceful, though some, unable to pass the police presence, expressed their disappointment. This year's ceremony was a rare convergence of Christian, Jewish, and Muslim holy days occurring at the same time. Authorities were insistent on preventing another deadly stampede of Christian revelers, as occurred in 1834. In a Catholic temple located in Mexico City lies an unusual figure of the crucified Christ. This representation, to which many miracles have been attributed, displays Christ as an entirely black figure. This is thought to be, perhaps, an appropriation linking Christ to the pre-Christian deity Tezcatlipoca, the creator and god of the local native tradition. But another explanation is often cited, one of faith and murder. It is said that Don Fermin Oeza visited the statue daily and kissed the feet in reverence. At this time, the statue was white. Don Fermin, however, had an enemy, Ismael Trevino, who decided to exact his revenge. Noting Don Fermin's daily habit, Ismael placed poison on the feet of the statue. He was thwarted, however, when the poison did not harm Don Fermin, but was absorbed into the statue, which turned black. The statue currently resides at the Altar of Forgiveness in the Metropolitan Cathedral of Mexico, where it is visited each day by locals and tourists, each desiring to gaze upon El Señor de Bonino, the Lord of Poison. A statue of Our Lady of Sorrows appeared to shed tears during Good Friday service in the Our Lady of Hope Church in La Libertad, Canton, Ecuador. Some stunned churchgoers filmed the event with their cell phones, while others dropped to their knees to pray and ask forgiveness. The statue was reported to have cried for three minutes. After news of the miracle spread, many faithful came to the church and passed handkerchiefs over the face of the statue in an effort to capture the tears. The parish priest has not issued a statement about the event. Local media reported that it will likely be investigated by the diocese. In St. Hilarion, we find a holy man who was so popular, he was followed from place to place by disciples and those who sought his blessings and miracles. St. Hilarion seemed to desire nothing more than solitude, but in his long life only found it in brief interludes before his example of holiness and his reputation would bring fellow religious and lay people alike to his door. After his death, even his body had to be secreted away. My main source for this episode was the biography of St. Hilarion, written by another saint, Jerome. This biography appears in the book Early Christian Lives, translated by Carolyn White and published by Penguin Classics. In the last decade of the 3rd century, in the village of Tabitha, five miles south of Gaza, Hilarion was born to pagan parents. He was sent to Alexandria to be educated. While studying here, Hilarion converted to Christianity. While still a teenager, Hilarion heard about St. Anthony, who was famed for his holiness throughout Egypt. Hilarion headed off to the desert to seek St. Anthony, He found the great desert teacher and stayed with him for two months, learning prayer and austerity. Soon, Hilarion found that great crowds of people were coming to Anthony for instruction, healing, and exorcisms. Hilarion decided that he should follow in St. Anthony's footsteps and seek desert solitude. Hilarion's parents were now deceased, so he returned to Tabitha with a few other monks and divided his parents' property. He gave everything away to the poor and his fellow monks. He kept nothing for himself. 
At the young age of 15, Hilarion walked into the desert alone. This desert, near Majuma, was infamous as the home of bloodthirsty bandits. Dressed only in sackcloth and a coat of skins which St. Anthony had given him, Hilarion moved from place to place in the desert, avoiding the bandits by never sleeping in the same place two nights in a row. He survived on dried figs, which he ate only after sunset. Though separate from society, the devil still moved to tempt Hilarion with notions that prompted impure scenes in the young man's mind. Determined to best these thoughts, Hilarion adopted a diet that was even more sparse than before, saying, I will stop your kicking, you ass. I will make you weak with hunger and thirst. I will weigh you down with a heavy load. Through heat and cold, I will strive to ensure that you think of food rather than sexual gratification. Hilarion began to eat only every three or four days, taking the juice of dried herbs and only a few dried figs. He prayed and sang psalms often. He hoed the earth to increase the pain of fasting with the effort of physical labor. He wove baskets in imitation of the Egyptian monks. Hilarion's ascetic life caused him to become emaciated, his flesh barely hiding the bones beneath. At the age of 16, Hilarion built a small hut of woven reeds and sedge. He lived in this hut for four years, afterwards building a cell that was so small it was said you might mistake it for a tomb rather than living quarters. Hilarion slept on the bare earth or a mat of rushes. He never washed the sackcloth and did not change his tunic until it became torn to shreds. He cut his hair once a year on Easter. Hilarion maintained an intense prayer life. It was said that, after his prayers and reciting the psalms, he would recite the scriptures, which he knew by heart. One night, a host of strange and frightening sounds began to greet Hilarion's ears. Women weeping, babies crying, sheep bleeding, cattle lowing, lions roaring, and the noise of a great army approaching. Realizing these sounds came from demons trying to mock and frighten him, Hilarion fell to his knees and made the sign of the cross. He fought the urge to look for the source of the sounds, but eventually curiosity caused him to look around. In the moonlight he made out the form of a chariot, pulled by neighing horses, speeding towards him, as if to crush him. Hilarion caught upon Jesus and watched the earth open, swallowing the demonic procession. Hilarion would be tormented by other visions. Naked women appeared to him when he rested. Huge banquets of food would appear when he was fasting. Often when he prayed, a howling wolf and a snarling fox would leap over him. Sometimes, as Hilarion sang the psalms, he would see gladiators. One of them, who appeared to be mortally wounded, begged to be buried by the saint. Once, when Hilarion became distracted in his prayer, something jumped upon his back, kicking his sides and whipping his neck as if it was riding Hilarion like a horse. Why are you falling asleep? the demonic form asked, taunting him about becoming tired and tempting him with food. When Hilarion was eighteen, a group of robbers heard about the young man living in the desert alone and sought to find his hut. From sunset to sunrise they searched, but they were unable to locate the hermit. In the morning light the robbers finally located Hilarion. They asked him what he would do if robbers found him. Hilarion replied, A naked man does not fear robbers. The robbers said, But you might be killed. Hilarion answered, I might, and that is why I am not afraid of robbers. I am ready to die. Shocked by Hilarion's faith at such a young age, the robbers confessed that they had come to harm him, but his hut was hidden from them in the night. They then promised to change their ways and reform their lives. From the ages of 21 through 24, Hilarion lived on lentils soaked in cold water. After that, until the age of 27, he lived on dry bread and water. From the ages of 27 through 30, Hilarion lived on wild herbs and uncooked roots. From 31 to 35, his diet consisted of barley bread and vegetables lightly cooked without oil. 
eventually suffering from malnutrition that was affecting his skin and eyesight. Hilarion later added a small amount of oil to his food. He would continue this sparse diet into his 60s, at which time he eliminated bread from his diet, eating only 5 ounces of plain soup made from chopped vegetables and flour. He would eat this single meal only after sunset and continued this diet until his death decades later. For 22 years, Hilarion lived in desert solitude, though his reputation as a holy hermit had grown throughout the region. A woman from Eleutheropolis was the first to seek out Hilarion. When she found the hermit, she threw herself at his feet, weeping. Surprised to see a woman, Hilarion averted his eyes and did his best to ignore her. Pleading, she said, this sex gave birth to the Savior. And quoting the Gospel of Luke, she continued, Those who are well have no need of a doctor, but those who are ill. Hilarion gazed upon the woman at last and asked why she was crying. She explained that she was unable to conceive a child, which caused her husband to despise her. Hilarion raised his eyes to heaven and told the woman to have faith. She left, and Hilarion followed her, now in tears himself. A year later, Hilarion would see the woman once more, this time with her son. This was the beginning of many miracles and healings attributed to Hilarion. Elpidius and his wife, renowned among the Christians in the region, were returning from a visit with St. Anthony. They stopped in Gaza when their three children became very sick with a fever. Doctors had no hope of saving the children, and their mother sobbed in despair. Hearing there was a monk living in the desert nearby, she set out to find Hilarion, accompanied by her maids and servants. Reaching the hermit, the distressed mother said, I pray you in the name of Jesus, our most merciful God, I implore you by his cross and his blood to give me back my three sons. May the name of our Lord and Savior be glorified in the city of the Gentiles. May his servant enter Gaza, and may the idol Marnus fall to the ground. Marnus was a pagan god worshipped in Gaza. Hilarion refused the woman's request, stating that he would not go into a village, much less a city like Gaza. Throwing herself on the ground before the hermit, the woman said, Hilarion, Christ's servant, give me back my children. Everyone present wept, including Hilarion. Eventually, the hermit agreed to enter Gaza by night. Reaching the place where the children lay sick, Hilarion made the sign of the cross upon each child's bed and upon their fevered limbs, calling on the name of Jesus as he did these things. Each of the boys began to sweat profusely and, within an hour, recognized their mother and began to take food. Thanking God, they kissed the holy hermit's hands. As the news of this healing spread throughout the region, many people came to believe in Christ. Others sought out Hilarion as a teacher of the monastic way. Another woman, who had become blind, came to Hilarion complaining that she had spent all her money on doctors, but none could heal her sight. Hilarion admonished her, saying, If you had given to the poor what you wasted on doctors, Jesus, the true doctor, would have cured you. She cried and begged for mercy. Hilarion, imitating Jesus, spat on her eyes, and, just as Jesus healed the blind man, the woman's sight was returned. A charioteer from Gaza had been struck by a demon and partially paralyzed. Carried to Hilarion on a litter, the man could only speak to ask for help. Hilarion told the man that he would not be healed until he believed in Jesus and gave up chariot racing. The man converted and promised to leave his profession, after which he was healed. However, he was more joyful of the healing of his soul than the healing of his body. Marcitus, an extraordinarily large man from Jerusalem, known for his great strength, 
was dragged to Hilarion, wrapped in ropes and chains. Marcetus had been possessed by a vicious demon. He was known to break the leg irons and chains that bound him. He had attacked people, bitten off some of their noses and ears. Others he had broken their legs and feet. The sight of Marcetus struck fear in the hearts of many, including Hilarion's brother monks. Hilarion ordered them to untie Marcetus, and he said to the possessed man, Bow your head and come here. Trembling, Marcetus averted his eyes, bent down, and began to kiss Hilarion's feet. The demon was cursed and tormented for seven days before it departed, and Marcetus departed as well, now healed. A wealthy man named Orion was possessed by a legion of demons. He was brought to Hilarion, weighted down by chains and iron, his eyes showing madness and ferocity. As Hilarion was speaking with his brothers, interpreting scripture, Orion broke free, grabbed Hilarion from behind, and lifted him over his head. There were gasps and screams for fear the possessed man might break Hilarion's limbs, made thin from years of asceticism. Hilarion simply smiled and said, Quiet, let go this wrestler of mine. He took hold of Orion's hair and twisted himself in front of the man, standing on his feet. Hilarion said, Here is torture for you, you crowd of demons. Here is torture for you. Orion's body arched backward, his head touching the ground, and Hilarion said, O Lord Jesus, release this poor man, release this captive, as you have the power to overcome one, so you can overcome many. From Orion's mouth issued many different voices, sounding like a babbling crowd. The demons left, and the man was healed. Later, Orion returned to the monastery with his wife and children, bearing gifts for Hilarion. Hilarion refused the gifts. In tears, Orion said that Hilarion should give them to the poor. Hilarion answered that Orion himself should take the gifts and distribute them among the poor. Do not be sad, my son, Hilarion said. What I do for my own good, I also do for yours. For if I were to accept these things, I would offend God, and the legion of demons would return to you. A man from Majuma had become paralyzed in an accident while quarrying stones near the monastery. His fellow workers carried him to Hilarion. The paralyzed man was cured and returned to work the same day. Italicus was a Christian public official who lived in Gaza. He kept horses to race against the other magistrates, as was the custom at the time. Italicus became aware that his rival, a pagan, had engaged the services of a magician who used demonic spells to slow Italicus' horses. Italicus went to Hilarion and asked the holy hermit for spiritual protection from his rival. Hilarion considered this a trivial matter and entreated Italicus to, instead, sell his horses and give the money to the poor. Italicus replied that as a public official, he was compelled to take part in these races, but as a Christian, he was not allowed to use the services of a magician like his rival. At the request of his fellow monks, Hilarion ordered that his earthenware cup be filled with water and given to Italicus. The cup was taken to his stables, and the water sprinkled upon Italicus' horses, chariots, and charioteers. Hearing what Italicus had done, his rival laughed at the man, and made a point of telling everyone what Italicus had done. But when the starting signal was given, Italicus' horses surged forward with great speed, while his rival's chariot wheels stood still, unmoving, as if they were locked in place. The roar of the crowd was deafening, as even the pagans shouted, Marnus has been defeated by Christ. A young man from Gaza became enamored with a young Christian girl who lived next door to him. The virgin ignored his advances and turned away from his affection. Desperate, the young man sought the aid of pagan priests who gave him sheets of bronze engraved with strange spells and sigils. He tied these with a string and buried them beneath the threshold of the girl's house. The effect was immediate. The young woman began to rave, tearing her veil from her head and calling for the young man. Her parents, however, took her to Hilarion. In the presence of the monk, the demon possessing the young girl began to scream. What tortures, what torments I suffer. You force me to depart, but I am tied up, imprisoned beneath the threshold. I cannot depart unless the young man lets me go. 
Hilarion mocked the demon, saying, Your strength must indeed be great if you are held down by a string and a metal plate. Hilarion exorcised the demon without care for the young man, as he did not want it to seem as if the demon only departed when the spells were broken, nor did he want it to be said that he heeded the demon's words, noting that demons are cunning and deceitful. Hilarion's fame began to spread throughout Palestine and Egypt, and even into distant lands. Even the emperor's assistant, Constantius, became aware of the holy monk. Constantius had been possessed by a demon from his infancy, which caused him to groan and scream at night, gnashing his teeth. He was given permission from the emperor to travel to Gaza and seek out Hilarion. Constantius arrived with a large retinue in tow and a letter on his behalf for the governor of Palestine. When Constantius inquired about Hilarion, the people were afraid that he was sent by the emperor to take away the monk, or worse, but they led Constantius and his group to the monastery. The group found Hilarion walking alone in the desert sands. Seeing a large crowd coming towards him, Hilarion blessed them. After a time, he sent everyone away but Constantius and his people, seeing in the man's eyes why he had come to him. Hilarion questioned Constantius, who, by the demon's power, stood on his toes, barely touching the ground, and began speaking loudly in Syriac, a language Constantius did not know, with a perfect Palestinian accent. Hilarion asked the means in which the demon had entered the man, and it answered in a howling voice that spells and magic devices laid upon Constantius had opened him to possession. Hilarion asked again in Greek, so that Constantius retinue might understand what was happening, and the demon gave the same reply, this time in Greek. Hilarion then said, I do not care how you entered, but I order you to depart in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The demon left Constantius, who offered Hilarion ten pounds of gold as a reward. Hilarion refused the payment, instead giving Constantius barley bread, saying, Those that live on this bread consider gold to be worth no more than mud. Animals were also brought for Hilarion's help. An enormous Bactrian camel had gone mad and trampled many people to death. It was restrained with thick ropes and led to Hilarion by thirty men. Foaming at the mouth with bloodshot eyes, it roared in anger. Hilarion ordered the animal untied. The men complied but immediately ran away from the angry camel. Hilarion walked calmly to the animal and said, You do not frighten me, devil, with your huge body. You are exactly the same in a fox as in a camel. The camel approached Hilarion raging and looked as if it would attack the monk, but instead it knelt down, bending its head to the ground. The camel thereafter became gentle and calm. Due to Hilarion's fame and holy example, monasteries sprang up all around Palestine. Hilarion would often travel to visit his fellow monks. On one occasion, he was making his way to visit a monastery and passed through the town of Eleusa. It happened to be the day in which the people of Eleusa gathered in their temple to worship Venus. Hilarion's reputation preceded him, however, and the people gathered in the streets to see the holy man and ask for his blessing. Hilarion greeted them humbly and asked them to worship God instead of stones. He promised if the people converted, he would visit Eleusa often. The citizens of Eleusa were so moved that they refused to allow Hilarion to leave until he had traced out the place where the foundation of their future church would rest. On a visit to another monastery, Hilarion, traveling with a massive entourage of monks, was asked to stay with a certain monk known for his stinginess, Hearing that Hilarion was coming for a visit, this stingy monk placed guards throughout his vineyard to ensure visitors would not eat his grapes. Traveling onward, Hilarion was then asked by another monk named Sabas to stay with him. Sabas invited Hilarion and all who traveled with him into his vineyard to eat grapes at will. Hilarion blessed the vineyard and those that traveled with him entered and ate their fill. 
It was estimated that the vineyard had only 100 flagons of grapes before the traveling monks were invited in to eat. Twenty days later, however, this vineyard produced 300 flagons of grapes. The Stingy Brothers' vineyard, however, produced much less than normal, and all that he harvested turned to vinegar. By the time Hilarion reached age 63, his fame was so great that crowds of people surrounded him, both monks and those that came to him for blessings and healings. He longed for his old life of solitary prayer, but his disciples begged him to stay among them. Two years later, a woman visiting the monastery told Hilarion that she intended to visit St. Anthony next. Hilarion replied that he would accompany her, except that he was held prisoner by his duties, and besides, he said, there is no point in going. Today it is two days since the world was bereaved of such a father. A short time later, a messenger brought news of St. Anthony's death. Finally, Hilarion's longing for solitude led him to acquire a donkey. He tried to leave without alerting anyone, but as word got out, thousands of people from the region gathered around him, refusing to let him leave. Watches were set to ensure Hilarion would not leave. Finally, the holy man declared that he would not take any food or drink until he was allowed to depart. After seven days of fasting, the people finally relented, and Hilarion left, accompanied by a small group of monks who were strong enough to travel while fasting. This marked the beginning of a period which found Hilarion traveling through the deserts, visiting fellow monks, the exiled bishop Draconteus, Philo, the bishop of Babylon, and eventually back to the desert to the Rocky Mountain where St. Anthony had spent his final days. Hilarion stayed in that place to mark the anniversary of St. Anthony's death before returning to the desert outside the town of Aphrodite in Egypt. Here, only accompanied by two other monks, Hilarion resumed his silent and ascetic lifestyle to such a degree that he declared that it was only then that he had begun to truly serve Christ. The region, however, had been through a period of intense drought. The people believed that the elements themselves were mourning the death of St. Anthony. Having heard stories of Hilarion's holy deeds, the people, now starved and pale with hunger, came to the holy man and begged him to pray for rain. Seeing the pitiful-looking crowd, Hilarion raised his eyes to heaven and lifted his hands. That instant it began to rain. As soon as the land had been soaked by rains, however, a large number of snakes and other venomous creatures emerged. The people again came to Hilarion, who blessed oil with which the farmers and shepherds could treat the bites and stings. Whoever applied that blessed oil to their wounds recovered completely. Noticing the crowds gathering about him, as they had in the desert outside Gaza, Hilarion again decided to move. He stayed with some monks outside of Alexandria. These men begged the holy hermit to stay with them, but Hilarion left, telling them that they would understand why he had to depart later. The next day, men from Gaza arrived and entered the monastery looking for Hilarion, as they had heard he arrived there. After Hilarion had departed Gaza, the Emperor Julian had issued a decree that Hilarion be put to death, and his monastery near Gaza was destroyed. Hilarion then entered the desert once more and stayed at an oasis for about a year. Hadrian, one of Hilarion's disciples from Palestine, sought out the holy hermit and informed him that the Emperor Julian had been killed and his successor, Jovian, was a Christian. He would be welcomed back to his old monastery. Hilarion instead headed to Peritoneum, a city on the coast of Libya. Hadrian greatly desired to return to Palestine, however, for he enjoyed the fame the monks had acquired in the region, and so he left after taking many supplies with him without Hilarion's knowledge. Shortly after this, Hadrian contracted leprosy. Hilarion next boarded a ship to Sicily with a single disciple. While crossing the sea, the son of the ship's master was possessed by a demon. He called out, saying, Hilarion, servant of God, why do you not allow us to be safe on the sea? Leave me until I reach land, for I do not want to be cast out here and fall headlong into the deep. Noticing the sailors and traders on the ship were watching, Hilarion replied, Stay, if my God lets you stay, but if he casts you out, 
Why should you blame me, a sinful man and beggar? He said this so he would not be identified by his reputation. Later, after Hilarion received the promise of the boy's father and the few other present that they would not betray him, the boy was exorcised. When he reached Sicily, Hilarion, afraid that he might be identified by travelers from the east, moved about twenty miles inland, taking up residence at an abandoned farm. He gathered wood, and his disciple would take it to the neighboring village to sell or trade for a little bread, which was their sustenance. Another demon, however, would soon betray Hilarion's location. At St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, a guard possessed by an unclean spirit began crying out, a few days ago, Hilarion, the servant of Christ, arrived in Sicily. No one has recognized him, and he thinks he can remain hidden. I shall go betray him. The guard, led by the demon within, boarded a ship to Sicily, arrived, then walked to Hilarion's hut, where he fell to the ground, immediately cured of the demon. Soon, as had happened before, crowds of religious seekers, as well as the unwell, looking for cures, soon gathered around Hilarion. Hilarion next moved to a coastal town in Dalmatia, seeking anonymity amongst the barbarian tribes. It was only a few days, however, before news of a gigantic serpent terrorizing the region reached the holy man. The massive dragon was devastating the region, consuming cattle, sheep, and even men. Hilarion ordered that a pile of wood should be built to make a pyre. He prayed and then called forth the dragon and ordered it to climb upon the pile of wood. With crowds of people watching, Hilarion then set fire to the wood and burned the massive serpent to ashes. There was a great earthquake around that time, which caused the sea to heave ships upon the mountainsides and churn and swirl as if it would swallow the town. Again the people turned to Hilarion. He stood upon the shore and drew three crosses in the sand. The sea had risen to a great height and seemed ready to crash upon the old monk when he raised his hands, stopping the water in place. It seemed to seethe angrily and rage against this barrier until at last it settled back into place. Knowing that news of these miracles would spread far and wide, Hilarion left in the night, first on a little boat, but eventually, with some of his disciples, he boarded a cargo ship bound for Cyprus. Along the way, they met with pirates, who approached the cargo ship in two large vessels. Hilarion stood in the prow, and when the pirates were no more than a stone's throw from the cargo ship, he raised his hand and said, No need to come any closer. The pirate ships were driven back. No matter how hard the oarsmen rowed, they were pushed further from the cargo ship, faster than they had approached. Hilarion took up residence outside Paphos, Within twenty days it seemed every demonic spirit in the region cried out that Hilarion had arrived, and they must seek him out. Within thirty days, hundreds of people had gathered to see the holy monk. Frustrated that he could not find the peace and quiet he longed for, Hilarion forcefully scolded them with prayers. The effect was that some in the crowd were cured immediately, others after a few days, but all were cured within a week. For two years, Hilarion stayed in this place before moving to a more remote location, 12 miles inland. In the remote mountains, there was an area which was extremely difficult to reach. The site of a ruined pagan temple, which was surrounded by fruit trees and a garden. While beautiful, the area was also terrifying, as the sound of an army of demons could be heard day and night, issuing from the ancient ruins. Rather than reacting with fear, Hilarion stated that he was pleased to have his enemies so close to him. Hilarion stayed in this place for five years. One day, Hilarion noticed a paralyzed man lying on his doorstep. Inquiring as to who he was, the man replied that he was an agent of the estate that held the garden at that place. Hilarion then held out his hand and, in the name of Jesus Christ, commanded the man to get up and walk. Before he had even finished speaking, the man began to stand, healed. News of this healing spread, and soon Hilarion was again being visited by many people, despite his remote location.
Hilarion was 80 years old when he wrote A Kind of Wheel, leaving his few meager possessions to his disciple, Hesuchius. Hearing word of this, many people came to visit the old monk. From all of them he obtained the promise that they would immediately bury him in the garden. In the year 371, Hilarion passed. His body was buried as he requested, however, a short time later, Hesuchius arrived, saying he wanted to live in the last place his master dwelt. After about ten months, however, Hesuchius took Hilarion's body back to the old monastery near Majuma to be reburied. Hilarion's body was incorrupt and gave off a pleasant fragrance, as if it had been anointed in perfume and oils. St. Hilarion's feast day is October 21st. I'd like to thank my new patron, Father Ken. Patrons and donations help me keep making the flower path and bringing you more content. All patrons get the regular episodes of the flower path ad-free, often before they drop on the regular podcast feed. Rose and Orchid tier patrons also get shout-outs on the show and extra content, including occasional extra episodes of the podcast. Orchid tier patrons get monthly merch mailings, This month, they got the t-shirts with the Flower Path logo. To check out all of the patron options and benefits, and to help me continue to make the Flower Path, go to patreon.com slash theflowerpath. You can also find a PayPal link if you want to make a one-time donation. Just click the support button at theflowerpath.com and look for the PayPal button that says donate. The sources for the news segment can be found in the show notes for this episode at theflowerpath.com. Please like and subscribe to The Flowered Path wherever you are listening. If you are inclined to leave a nice review, that will help as well. The Flowered Path is on YouTube, so please subscribe to our channel there. And no matter where you listen, if you like what you hear, please share the episodes on social media. You can find The Flowered Path on Facebook, facebook.com slash thefloweredpath, on Instagram at thefloweredpath, and on the web at thefloweredpath.com.